Um, so thank you, I would just like to echo uh, what Gideon has been saying. We're, uh, we're uh, super happy to be talking to you. So thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I think what we're going to try and talk to you about is that, um, is that I guess, um, the kind of the art of sustainable architecture um, uh, is, is, is in some ways, I guess, uh, uh, what we're, hope, we're hoping is art in there. And I think for us, art, I guess, uh, uh, is in some ways a product of, of what we do, and, and we hope there's this art comes from it. But in some ways, we don't try to create art as architecture, we don't try to create great architecture and we try to create mm -hmm. a provocative architecture and hopefully there is an artistic dimension um, to that. Um, so what we're going to try and show you over the next uh, uh, 45 minutes, I guess, or so, is um, how we then approach um, sustainable architecture and how we, that underpins almost everything that we do now uh, in the office. Um, and there'll be uh, the examples that we'll show you then over the next 45 minutes will be um, from around the world to sort of show you, I guess, how um, sustainability for us almost means understanding climate uh, as much as anything. So how can we try and create an architecture which is so climatically and responsive? And hopefully that gives us an architecture which is um, Incredibly sustainable, and then hopefully, then there's uh, an artistic dimension that comes to So, um, that's the plan. So, hopefully, uh, hopefully you'll, you'll enjoy it. We'll, we'll talk, but obviously, yeah, we, we're happy to have any questions at the end, obviously. Okay, good. Should we dive in? Okay, great. Okay, great. Um, so I'm hoping that you can see this um, on your screen there. So this is a, just an opening slide that we often use, which just shows um, our London campus, actually. Uh, it'll be the same that we're in Hong Kong at the moment, but this is the London studio. And the London studio is a fantastic place um, because it's a center of um, exploration more than anything. Um, so you can see people there studying uh, in all sorts of different ways, all sorts of different subjects. Um, and coming together right, around tables and benches and studios and, and, and sort of workplaces to try and see, I guess, how we can try and create uh, new approaches, new challenges, and uh, new ways of looking at things, new understandings uh, into things. Um, it's a really interesting place. There's lots of people doing all sorts of investigations and explorations. And, and if any of you are in London, then please get in touch with me. I'd love to show you around. I'm always uh, interested to hear the thoughts of other architects around the world and how uh, they, they think in their world. So we would love to uh, invite you to come to the office uh, at any time. Um, and what we do, um, I guess, is uh, try to create um, uh, design which is responsive, as I was saying. And we've been lucky enough to work, I guess, in all sorts of different locations with all sorts of different climates um, on all manner of different projects. Um, so those range from um, transportation systems, you can see on the right hand side in the middle uh, for the Bilbao Metro, uh, to Beijing uh, Airport in the bottom uh, in the middle, and to Milan Viaduct in France on the bottom left. And there are two forms of transportation, yachts, and cars, and then to all sorts of different types of buildings, whether they are sports stadiums in the top of the middle, um, or commercial buildings on the right in Calgary and Canada, or cultural buildings, stage gates, a concert hall on the right hand side in the middle of the Indian and Bibliotheque uh, in Nîmes, in France, on the far left. Hand. So I think we've been lucky to sort of look at all sorts of different buildings from city scale through to individual um, building scale. And from that, we've, we learned, uh, we've learned uh, an awful lot about uh, buildings which are um, 
in harmony with their landscape and hopefully yeah, produce something for exactly people like always. And I guess uh, the very essential of what we always try to do is create something which is um, of benefit to the people who will use it. And hopefully that's um, on a city scale. Um, but if it's not, if it's just on the industry scale, uh, then that's also okay. But what we try to achieve is that wherever we've been, hopefully the building, the place, the city, the room, uh, is a better place for us having been there, and that's how we always try to approach it. Um, Edel and I are both architects, um, but actually, but we're not just architects within the industry. Uh, we also have a lot of very smart people who are not architects, um, smart than architects, and, uh, and they are structural engineers, environmental engineers, uh, sustainability engineers, industrial designers. Um, urban designers and security designers and a whole host of people do a whole host of research for us um, ARD is applied research and development um, uh, MRC is material research and development SMG is a specialist modeling group and all these people explore and examine all sorts of ways to help us design uh, better buildings better spaces better systems uh, better environments uh, and they do that in all sorts of different ways um, from research through descripting to the parametrics and that has had a sort of a profound effect on all the ways that we work because they they give us the science for our artistic windows in some ways they prove to us whether things are better or, or worse um, and they're a, a kind of a fantastic sample and a really great check on our kind of artistic uh, aspirations uh, that can sometimes and shoot oh, us down idea. by saying, you know, I know you believe this, but it's just not true. And I can prove to you it's just not true. And therefore, they're a really interesting set of people that we have in the office. It's a fantastic place to check what we do. Um, and we have a number of offices uh, around the world. Uh, sadly, we don't have one in Turkey at this moment in time, but we would, we would love to have one, hopefully one day soon. And, uh, um, but what we wanted to guys then focus on was then uh, how we might design uh, buildings uh, envelopes and, and how they can respond in an I'm going to start with this photo, which I, I, I love this photograph. I found it when I very early came to Hong Kong, uh, so 15 years ago, I saw this photograph in, a, in an exhibition. And it's called Private, and I think it's a very beautiful photograph by a very famous Hong Kong photographer called Fan. Uh, it was quite prolific in the 1960s and the Hong Kong. But I think it, I thought it was very, I thought it was very beautiful, but I thought it was also incredibly um, kind of opposite of what we all do as architects. And I think we all try to create buildings which kind of in some ways do this. They uh, privatize things for people and they kind of shape things for people and they home spaces for people. And those spaces um, then are, 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 are given uh, life uh, by by the things that happen with them. And sometimes you can see glimpses of those things, and sometimes you can't see it at all. Sometimes it's put on full display. Um, but I thought this photograph was really lovely in a way of sort of like exploring uh, the the, the kind of the, the kind of the, the subtlety and the kind of the intensity of architecture. That in some ways, if you've seen all of this image, maybe it would be less mysterious, maybe it would be less interesting, maybe it would be um, less magical. Um, and it kind of reminded me too then of another thing that we that we do. This is called private. But I think for us, um, it could also be called comfort. And comfort is almost the word that we try to apply often to to buildings and envelopes and spaces that we that we design. So how can a building almost be comfortable? How can you control air velocities? How can you control light intensity? How can you control uh, light levels? How can you control humidity, air temperature? Um, and in some ways, this photograph kind of displays all of that. You know, you, the window is open, but you control the light. And you control the, the you control the air temperature. You get this incredibly sort of magical glimpse of these two people um, locked in conversation inside. I think it's quite a brilliant thing. And I think it kind of shows the power of architecture um, and how envelopes kind of control that power of architecture. Um, so um, this is a very old map that we also use a lot in the office, um, which explores um, in the early uh, 19th century how the the cartographers saw the world, and um, and the projects we're about to show you initially exist in this very hot red zone in the middle, this torrid zone. It's a fantastic name for the tropics, 
Um, Three billion people live in this torrid zone. And then uh, most other people live there in the temperate zone um, outside of there. So we're going to try and show you how our architecture responds to this torrid zone and how it also responds maybe to more temperate environments and how the two are very, very different, we think, and buildings will therefore be very different um, as a result of that. Um, in this torrid zone, and you will know this, and I'm sure Turkey is also equally hot, um, th this happens a lot. Um, people um, have carry umbrellas. They don't carry umbrellas because it's raining, although it rains a lot. They carry umbrellas simply to protect themselves from the searing heat um, and the incredible piercing daylight that you get and sunlight that you get from this kind of incredible zone. So in some ways, we, we, we try to protect ourselves from the sunshine as human beings. Um, but actually what you find uh, is then we don't do that with our buildings. So what we tried to do in a project that we did um, a few years ago now in Singapore was explore how then could we in some ways try to create an urban realm which was protected in the way that you protect yourself with an umbrella. So could we create an urban umbrella, something that would actually give you the intensity of experience of being in the tropics, uh, but also somehow protect you from it uh, with this kind of canopy that we put over the project. So this canopy was designed with Arab uh, to try to sort of mitigate the incredible heat, humidity, rain and sunshine that, that you all get in Singapore every single day. Um, Singapore is six minutes off the equator and therefore basically every day is almost the same. And without it, uh, you can see on the left hand side of the screen here, there's a little bar chart in the middle of the left hand side there, which shows that the thermal comfort zones outside in Singapore without any mitigation are just red, red hot day after day after day. So we tried to develop this canopy um, uh, to see how we could maybe change that in a way which would have no ongoing running costs. So it would be a passive system uh, that would sort of promote air flows and promote rainwater harvesting and promote solar harvesting too. Uh, so therefore then without intensity of the heat, but with increased uh, wind flows through there and cool temperatures and cool materials, uh, maybe we could produce an environment which was actually okay for people to exist in, in the urban realm and light enough that they could read a book and breezy enough that they weren't um, sweating if they were sitting having a coffee outside. Um, and so we, we, we tried really hard with some really clever engineers to sort of try and pioneer this, this device. And in the end, we got to a place which worked really, really well. And this was kind of some uh, thermal camera um, imaging that we did post occupancy to sort of ensure that it was working uh, really well. And you can see in, incredibly, uh, the ground surface temperature went from 55 uh, degrees C, white hot, to, uh, to 30 degrees C. Um, and the felt temperature plummeted from 45 degrees C uh, to 28 degrees C. And this is um, this was just with um, this was just with passive means. So we think there's a really interesting lessons here that in actual fact we don't have to burn fossil fuels to try to work in harmony with nature. We can actually do it in a passive way. Uh, and for us that was quite an interesting lesson that we wanted to then apply to the buildings. So again then when we looked at the architecture, it was how can we then begin to look at architecture that has always been in harmony with these incredible, uh, incredibly demanding, challenging environmental conditions. And actually we looked at the traditional buildings in the tropical areas of the world, and they have always responded in a very sympathetic way to these incredible temperatures. So uh, historically buildings in India have always had these uh, places where people rest and sit and meet next to windows, but the windows are small or louvered or ventilated. So they promote breezes through them, but you don't let any of the harsh uh, sunlight in. And the sunlight is either shaded from above or, or shaded um, from louvers on the, on the inside. So people have always been quite happy to exist in these areas, but you just need to mitigate the environment. In Japan, they have these incredibly beautiful uh, rooms that are very sort of deep with deep overhanging eaves so no sunshine gets in. And then these incredibly beautiful doors that slide out of the way to promote incredible uh, cross ventilation through the rooms. Uh, ancestral homes um, in Indonesia uh, take that a stage further by even having dark materials inside so the blistering white 
hot heat outside, which you can almost feel through the gaps and these breezes here, um, is kind of outside. But when you're inside this building, um, it's very cool, it's very calm, the, the light is filtered, it's a kind of a, it feels cooler inside this space. That's just through materiality and that's just through color choices. And we thought there were some really clever uses of how to live naturally in these environments, just when we were back at these ancestral homes. And when, when, uh, when Europeans came to Asia and they learned very quickly uh, how to do this and just to take complete advantage and, and learn very quickly from people who've learned how to live in these areas. And these are the initial uh, black and white houses in the early 20th century in Singapore. And they do exactly what the, has always been done traditionally. So predominantly walls with small windows. The light is so hot here, it's so bright that you don't need big windows to flood these rooms uh, with daylight. So small windows, lots of wall to keep out the heat. And then a high level, then a series of um, louvers that actually allow high level air to pass in through the through to, to the rooms, even if the windows are closed for security, even if you're out of the building um, and the doors and windows are closed, they still allow ventilation into the building, through the building, and so that when you return, the building is still cool. And even more on from that, then uh, people quickly learned then as kind of affluence grew um, through the 20th century that you could actually begin to maybe live outside in these incredible environments, um, but you needed to be very, very protected from it. So these incredibly sort of evocative um, tropical veranda spaces became uh, widespread across uh, across Asia and people lived in these verandas. They actually lived outside in these spaces. They were heavily shaded. They had fans often in there to promote air movements uh, with very high ceilings again, promoting air movements and very open, incredibly porous. So breezes could blow through. Uh, you're shielded from the incredible uh, startling sunlight and then darker, warmer, cooler colors again on the inside. And these sort of inside outside spaces Kind of lovely spaces uh, to live in and kind of a key as to how to live in, in the tropical spaces and then finally raffles hotel again in singapore um, where they take this uh, inside to outside and degrees of privacy and degrees of coolness and uh, kind of go further back into the building so you go from the outside veranda uh, protected um, from the sunlight um, to the next space inside where it's maybe a slightly more public uh, but sort of cooler space, going through again to the sort of deeper inside the building, surrounded by very big stone walls where it's the coolest you can possibly be, uh, into the bedroom space, again, with the high level um, natural ventilation openings at the top and, and the glazing and the cool doors that you can shut for privacy at, at the bottom. So this kind of layering of facades from outside to inside, taking materials darker and deeper and, and more dense as you go into the building was kind of a really fascinating way and to sort of, we thought that people had learned through history to sort of live in these areas and live very harmoniously um, with nature without burning uh, fossil fuels. It seemed that in the sort of the mid to late 20th century that people began to understand this and there were contemporary approaches to how you might then redefine some of these traditional materials or traditional uh, motifs in a more contemporary way. And there were fantastic ways that people began to look at how that, that might begin to learn. And they almost came up then with these kind of case textbooks on how you could design in the tropics um, without, without burning fossil fuels. And we tried to sort of, in some ways, tabulate these things as this sort of tropical principles for how we might begin to then approach this uh, task of designing residential properties um, in, uh, in, in tropical climates. And then the project which uh, Idols is about to talk to you about is then how we took some of those ideas and then applied them to this project that we did in the Philippines, um, which is where that early photograph of those uh, women walking through that park all with umbrellas was just at the, just outside the project that Idols is uh, about to talk to you about. So I give them over to you. Um, so our studio is currently working on a 45-story residential skyscraper, PWGC, in Philippines. And we are really interested in to apply what we learned from context, its history and traditions to our design. So the site is located on the central Manila, right on the edge of the golf club. And the location offers great views towards the greenery that positions the building for better ventilation and access to natural sunlight. 
Uh, Manila has a tropical climate with high temperature and humidity. So we aim to mitigate the temperature and humidity by using passive design strategies to create better comfort for the resident. Um, in BWGC, a single apartment occupies a whole floor plan with a semi-detached core, as you can see from the plan. And again, learning from all those great things from the history, we have a veranda wrapping around the whole building that creates a perimeter buffer zone. The building become more public on the outside and more private on the inside. So you can clearly see the layering of the spaces as Colin also talked earlier. So these helps the fresh air flow through the floor plate and allows cross ventilation and cool the air without any interruption. Um, also, as you can see, the wrapped out veranda is shielded uh, with the roof overhang. The veranda also acts as a thermal buffer and protect into from the direct sunshine. On the traditional Asian architecture examples of Colin Show, there were small operable windows about the main window. So speaking back to the tropical principles, we have similar overhead panels with ventilation slots about the overhang, and that maximize the breeze and getting the light penetrated through it. And overhang reduce the amount of the facade area that is exposed to direct sunlight and diffuse the light into the interior. And also we have those like ceiling fans for comfort and they help to move the air inside. And they're also, they also use less energy than AC units. So the overhang inspired by a safari car roof and the car roof actually uh, is a single sheet of metal which actually begs you inside. But safari car have two layer of metal roof which helps the air flows inside and cools the air. And we use a similar system on our overhang design. Um, well, the, beside the sustainable strategies of this residential tower, uh, the units have like this great expansive views. And you can see the city uh, very clearly. And then you can actually, like you have this full city towards the city skyline and it, it it extends to the adjacent park and creates like the spatial connection to Manila's central green space. And the, actually looking at this veranda, getting closer to the interior, uh, the veranda is like function as an extension of the living space. So it's not a balcony, like it's not an additional space outside, but it's a space for living that offers flexibility and variety of functions for its user. So we were very interested uh, to carefully design the apartments for the comfort of the resident. So it's not a really big open white space with a lot of sun coming inside, but we wanted to create a cooler, darker space. So we use materials such as timber, stone, and speci like specially detailed down for this luxury project. And that gives exclusivity and uniqueness for the interior. Throughout the design process of a residential project we actually question a lot about the, how we live and how the residents are behaving in the space so that gives us an opportunity to us uh, coming with an inside out approach so each design decision even placing a chair we think from the residents perspective like when they sit there what they will see and how they will interact with their surroundings so tropical climates are as Colin said, very sunny, but at the same time, they are very rainy as well. So no one wants to be exposed and people want to protect from the sun and rain. The traditional black and white houses in Singapore is a great example of this and how to create an enclosed space where the building is protected under a huge canopy. And we wanted to do exactly the same thing. So this, uh, this is the ground floor of the building and there's a drop off behind those like uh, large columns and we wanted to create this as an enclosed drive through space that feels protected and actually the building entrance have a direct connection to the park next to it and that creates kind of like a friendly environment and also the building entrance thoughtfully designed to create the sense of arrival for the pedestrian and you can reach your apartment by a private lift from the semi-detached external core. And those lifts you see, they are directly accessible by the drop-off and underneath the building. So the core location actually provides the lift lobby's natural ventilation and daylight. 
um, which significantly reducing the energy consumption of the building. So the drop off gives you the feeling of enclosure, privacy and security. So there's no direct light, it's cooler and darker space with a sense of arrival. Well, this is BWGC and this project is a great example of how we get inspired of the traditional architecture, how we learn from the context and how we apply to the tropical climate of the design principles. Great. Um, so then maybe then from, from, uh, from the Philippines, uh, we then just maybe take you across then a short flight uh, to an equally uh, slightly less tropical, but, but nevertheless, hot and sticky place, which is Hong Kong, uh, where, where, where I and I currently are. So um, a few years ago, we were approached by one of the big uh, developers here in Hong Kong to uh, work on the Murray, the Murray Hotel. Um, the Murray Hotel building, I wonder if you can see my, if you can see, I'm hoping you can see our cursor. Um, so the Murray Hotel is, yeah, that was, yeah that's it. It's the Murray Hotel, I'm hoping you can see the cursor. If you can't, it's just the building on the far right-hand side um, of, the, of the project, uh, the photograph here, um, which was this uh, government uh, headquarters uh, building um, that when it was completed in 1971 was uh, amazingly uh, the tallest building um, in Hong Kong at that moment in time. Uh, skip forward uh, 50 years um, and it now, it's now lost in the stalagmite um, existence that is uh, Hong Kong's urban skyline. Um, but actually, I'm going to try and point it out to you, and hopefully that you can uh, that you can still see my cursor. So actually, now if you can see my cursor, hopefully it's this little it's this little guy just here. Um, so it, it kind of got lost uh, in some ways in the urban uh, jungle, the urban uh, excitement that is uh, uh, urbanity in Hong Kong, which is this extraordinary intense. Uh, urban experience that is incredible. Um, but it had also got lost um, kind of emotionally and, and, and physically as well to the people of Hong Kong. It's kind of, it was sad. And it was literally chained off and it was kind of a sad thing to see. And people had really no understanding of how you even got into it. It was kind of removed from people's uh, mind map of how you navigate uh, central Hong Kong. Um, even this, this incredibly beautiful tree you can see on the right hand side image, um, which was this very beautiful blossom cotton tree, which blossoms twice a year. And that has even been uh, encased in asphalt and uh, encased in concrete, sort of growing valiantly through the concrete, uh, still uh, 50 years on. But it was uh, it was this kind of building which had somehow lost its soul, it kind of lost its spirit and it had lost its connection uh, to the city. So what we really wanted to do was to sort of uh, re-give it back to the people of Hong Kong to sort of uh, remove its kind of uh, outer shell and this kind of uh, caged off um, feeling to it and create it, give it back um, as, a, as a viable proposition to the people's understanding of how you might uh, live and navigate your way through this part of Hong Kong and the new hotel would be open and available to people and they would, they would kind of understand all of that. So uh, to make it almost like a sustainable proposition and, and that in like an urban sense, we wanted to just completely open it up and transform it to be a uh, public thoroughfare in a sense that you would simply walk through the building um, and, and that was okay. That's part of, the, part of the purpose of the building to sort of stitch this lost piece of urban terrain back into the wider context of the city. So we took these spaces, uh, as you can see there, and completely opened them all up and made them very public. So the trees you can now see is now sort of standing um, available. You can walk up to it and touch it. Uh, and the whole um, open uh, ground plane of the building and the upper ground plane of the building have been made completely porous and open and now surrounded and, 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 and covered uh, and infused and, and sort of fielded by, by public spaces and public facilities. So all of these terraces uh, that you can see here are now public and open and available uh, to people as they walk through and around uh, Hong Kong. Um, and it's a question of trying to take all of these previous, um, the unavailable uh, spaces, which were still sort of uh, uh, um, uh, enthralled to the car and change them so that they became um, enthralled to people uh, and they were surrounded and bordered by um, cafes and restaurants and bars and lounges uh, that were people focused and not uh, and not car focused. So that's in some ways a way of sort of making it a more sustainable piece of urban planning. 
and giving it back to people at Hong Kong was, was one thing. But what became really apparent to us as we designed the building was that in some ways, this building, uh, which was built 50 years ago, was entirely different to the buildings which are now being built in the middle of Hong Kong, which are, which are these. This is, this is literally out the window from where Idan and I are sitting. And we now surround ourselves, um, it seems to us, and kind of sadly with these buildings, which are just um, glass greenhouses on a colossal urban scale. Um, and with that, we feel um, this building, this little modest building that was built 70 years ago, um, all the lessons and all the great things that were in that building somehow have been lost in this, uh, in this, new, this new urban uh, approach to architecture in the tropics for commercial buildings. Because when you look at those buildings, looking up at them, they look very, um, uh, they look very impressive, perhaps. Yeah, I can imagine developers and visitors to the city might think that they have an astoundingly futuristic uh, view to them, that they have that crystalline skyline that you see in uh, the latest um, Marvel DC movies. Um, but in actual fact, the reality of it is um, when you look at them, uh, not from the ground, but when you look at them flat on, this is what you see. You actually see that nobody looks into these buildings and actually no one looks out either um, because it's so hot inside there that everybody pulls down the blinds or everybody closes uh, the curtains. There are very few places where people uh, are working or standing or sitting next to these incredible crystalline facades because because they're just so hot. Um, and then the ultimate irony of all of this is then they are so hot to sit next to that everybody pulls the blinds down, everybody closes the curtains, and everybody ramps up the air conditioning inside the building to such an extent that even in the tropics where it is blistering 33 degrees outside and 95% new humidity inside the building, people are wearing jumpers and coats and hoods to keep themselves warm because the air conditioning is so high that they have to do that to keep warm. So you have the slightly mad situation where the, the mullions on the outside of the building are nearly 60 degrees C in temperature. And then with the blinds up, there is nearly 19,000 lux on the horizontal surfaces on the inside of the building. And even with the blinds down, it's 2,600 lux. And when the recommended maximum uh, by the six codes internationally is about 2,000 lux and recommended that it's only around 500 lux. So we seem to have got this thing completely wrong, we think, about how we might design appropriate commercial buildings um, for tropical climates, where we seem to only be interested in designing these glass crystalline uh, towers that somehow seem to represent uh, progress or modernity, but in actual fact seem to be completely the opposite, uh, we think. Um, if you look back to even the same time that Ron Phillips, who is the architect who designed the Murray building, was building, there was a whole movement of people who were studying how we might live in a more uh, passive way with uh, aggressive external uh, environments. And these people came up with some really interesting solutions. They were very pioneering developments that explored all sorts of potentially really uh, clever ways of dealing with these climates that produce really excellent buildings with incredibly interesting uh, approaches to elevation and depth and layering and understanding the climate that you're working with and working with that climate and not just simply ignoring it. And Ron in uh, the Murray building here in Hong Kong, Ron Phillips, uh, did exactly the same thing. And you can see what I'm about to talk to you about here, the genius of his design, which we can claim no credit for, I'm quite sad to say. <laughs> the genius of his design was simply this, and this photograph demonstrates it beautifully. You can see that actually even in the intense tropical sunlight here in Hong Kong on an average day, um, that the glass receives no sunlight you can see that the shadow there cast by uh, this incredibly clever 45 degree elevation that he designed uh, completely shades all of the glass. So only the concrete, only the dense mass stone concrete elevations, they take all of the blistering sunshine and the glass is, uh, is completely shaded every day. So how he did this was in this very simple diagram. It was a, um, 
uh, it's a stroke of genius, we think, and Ron is a super, super modest guy and would deny it was genius, but um, he, he, we think he is, his, his work is pioneering and clever and sadly ignored um, in the 21st century. Um, you can see here what he did. So no columns in the building um, at all, the central core. He then put um, a series of concrete blade walls, which were the external structure, the perimeter structure to the tower. And arranged it so that he understood that the building was at 45 degrees to north and south. And therefore, if he arranged all of these blade walls uh, running exactly north south, the incredibly hot uh, morning sun here in Hong Kong and the incredibly even hotter uh, afternoon sun here in Hong Kong would simply miss the glass. It would only hit uh, the concrete. And when the highest sun was very, very high in the sky at midday, um, the very small overhang that he put on each of the horizontal bands meant that the glass was completely shaded throughout the day. So through, with no computers, with just a T-square and a set and adjustable set square, uh, Ron designed this uh, work of um, simple, simple genius, uh, we think. And as a model for how we should be living uh, appropriately um, in, the, in, in tropical climates, We've seen nothing better, despite all the computer power and algorithms and uh, clever people working in architecture today, we've seen nothing better than this. And you can see how cleverly it works. So uh, this, is, this is his building. When you look at it uh, now, looking from the east, uh, you can see here, you don't see any glass. All you see is concrete, strong, dense walls. But when you're in the building, the building is filled full of natural light. You can look at the building on the left, and it's stripped all of the project out and just exposed the windows. The floor is completely filled with light and the views are abundant and they have these incredibly beautiful views. So he had only 27% of the window was uh, glass, 73% uh, of it was, um, was solid, which gives a 70% reduction in total solar gains over a typical new building that is being built up here. So completely, uh, we think a standing clever uh, piece of piece of architecture. And then when you begin to look at this, and we then worked um, on the buildings, and we had the joy of working with this architecture, um, we could then begin to plan really interesting and beautiful and quite human spaces that go with that. So when you look into the rooms that we then designed behind his facade, um, you get these really beautiful little pocket spaces, pocket spaces uh, for bathing, pocket spaces for working, pocket spaces for relaxing and socializing. It became this really lovely cascade of events you could then plan behind each of these different windows. Um, and then when you're in the space, you can see um, each of these rooms then has a really beautiful framed view out to the Hong Kong, but it is completely shaded. Uh, and completely uh, and completely sort of in harmony uh, with the harsh tropical sunshine here. So uh, for us, it was a, an object lesson in how to work uh, in harmony with, um, with, um, with nature and try not to compete with it. And, and therefore, in a sense, to be much, so much more sustainable. And uh, we ran some simple numbers on this and benchmark ball, ballpark numbers. We think that um, the building has saved over 20,000 tons of carbon to date, uh, compared to running uh, an AC bill on a standard building with a glass facade uh, that we showed you in the early slides compared to this. This is one building saving 20,000 tons of carbon and uh, being worked out by wrong with a set square. Uh, we think it's quite an astounding achievement on his part. And, and for us, it seems to be an object lesson in how we should be maybe thinking about design uh, moving forward. And, and just to sort of go back to the title of the, of the talk, this is the art of sustainable architecture. We think the architecture is just beautiful and, uh, and it's a total credit to, to him as a, as a super artistic, incredibly talented designer from 50 years ago. Um, okay, now I'm going to give you, so now from a very hot climate uh, to a very cold climate, I'm going to pass back to Idol uh, in Russia. Yes, and on the cold climate, but also from Hong Kong and Philippines, we're getting closer to Turkey. So we actually recently just completed our first project in Russia for RMK headquarters. So it's a 13 story office tower in Yekaterinburg and we rethink, rethink the conventional office space and we were interested to set new standards uh, in quality, comfort and flexibility with the interior layout. 
Uh, we carefully analyzed how RMK operates inside out and arrange the office organization according to their operations and make it bespoke to them. So they told us they work in similar cluster, four people and six people working as a team, and we look into how we can do it for them. The starting point of the office floor was to reinvent the headquarter as a house of staff and instead of creating a large office space. The rooms become more intimate and domestic scale, and then the scale of the rooms depend on the number of the occupant. So if there is like, it depends on if there's six people or four people, and then we check the ideal, ideal daylight for the concentrated work. So at the end of this exercise, the rooms end up with different heights. So actually stacking them side by side would be weird. So we actually stack them vertically on top of each other. So every each like every module ended up with two story, and we express it externally throughout the double stock stacking module, and it start to work as a section. So the upper module, as you can see, has four occupants with a smaller headroom, and then the lower module is with six occupants with a larger headroom, where all the office space actually have an access to an optimum sunlight, and they are facing to a shared atrium. The modules are arranged in a row, and they have a central hallway, and they're either side of the hallway. And the hallway functions as a flexible breakout space with a lounge seating, and there, there is like views towards the city, towards the glazed lift at the back. So it's kind of like a three-dimensional jigsaw. And this configuration of double stacking the workspaces created a visual connection to the central lounge space and to the other side as well. And RMK as a company, it's a leader copper producer in the world, and we wanted to show the beauty of the copper material. So we use warm materials for both architecture and interiors, like tactile pellet of wood, stone, and natural tones of the textile, but also interior office walls. Uh, you can see that they are faced with glass, and the junction between the glass panels are highlighted in metal. That are also these elements also complements to the facade, the metallic envelope. So the construction of this project, it was as we designed it modular, the construction was modular as well. And you can see one module on this image, and then that beautiful concrete that spans around like six meters. But even throughout the construction process, the project without any finishes look already like super beautiful. And so this is the facade, and the facade is made up of, you can see the triple glazing and the triangulated bronze colored steel panels, which appear subtly to change according to the season and sun of the pet. So Yekaterinburg have a high temperature shift between seasons, so the balance between solid and glazed area they are designed to maximize the low level winter sun while blocking the heat of the direct sunlight during the summer. And now you can understand the massing better from this view. So behind every facade module, there is like a two-story uh, two-story office module. So also talking about the Ekaterin climate, it's a bit opposite of Philippines and Hong Kong. So we say it's a freezing temperature. So buildings are very solid and they are heavily insulated. So Russia being on the north has this like very, very low sun. And to keep the temperature in the window, uh, to keep the temperature of the inside, the window should be very small. On the as like it on the first image. So, but as a result, the light coming from the window actually it it pinch your eye. So the triangular shape of the envelope help help us to create a more comfortable working environment. So the conventional office towers, you know, the windows are flat. That creates a high contrast in the interior space. And we took the same amount of glazing area and we tilted the window so we could get reduce the amount of the contrast and spread the daylight more equally to the space. The light intensity become to a comfortable level and it also maximizes the views and minimize the heat loss. And as you can see, the overall building looks sculptural and with the help of modules, it matched with the surrounding scale better. 
And when we showed the, this design to the client, they told us oh, it's, it, it actually looked like a copper molecule, like our old building. And actually, I think it indeed it looks like a copper molecule. Um, okay, uh, just the last two to talk to you about that. Let me go to then, I guess, having gone from uh, the torrid zone uh, and the map at the beginning and then into the temperate, uh, the cool zone, the frigid zone in, in Ekaterinburg. Uh, we're now going to go into the, um, into the temperate zone, the zone that sits in between. Um, and this is then our project that we completed a couple of years ago now, a few years ago now, uh, for Bloomberg, the financial um, uh, advisory uh, consultancy. Who, um, who this is their European headquarters in, in the city of London. Um, so when we when we first got to to know them, uh, they were um, they were a very interesting organisation who were who were fascinated with the idea of how we could design for them uh, and, and a super sustainable like benchmark sustainable uh, project for them in the city of London. But but key to the challenge in doing that is obviously then is to have a building which is natural ventilation so um, if we were going to try and create something for them which was pioneering and at the, sort of at the, at the bleeding edge of, of trying to create a, an office environment in a temperate environment then it has to be it has to be naturally ventilated um, but that's a challenge in a city like um, London which is you know it's the streets are noisy and the streets are full of cars and you know and if you open a window that you know that will come into the building you will you will hear the noise you will you will smell the traffic fumes uh, and, and 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 also uh, breezes will come through uh, paper will get blown off tables you know it's 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 not something that's going to be easily achievable so uh, there was a huge amount of work done to try to explore how we might uh, have a naturally ventilated uh, facade system um, on, a, on an office building, which is only modest height um, in the city of London. And it was it centered itself and resolved itself around these bronze fins that you can see in this, this photograph here. So these bronze fins do a number of things. Um, so they shade uh, the glass from direct sunlight kind of begin to see here too. So in the way that uh, Ron did on, on the Murray building with us, um, they performed it and it's sort of a similar function. Um, so they naturally shade um, the glass, which is which is great. Um, but they also then provide this means of, of naturally ventilating the space. So actually they are three-dimensional baffles uh, for naturally ventilating uh, into the into the into the space. So this is a diagram kind of cut away through that elevation to show how that might be. So each of those uh, full height bronze fins actually manages to, uh, on the inside edge as it interfaces with the, with the glass, actually then becomes um, uh, an internal baffle that uh, takes people, takes air in and through a series of movement systems and then in, into the building internally. But what it does that, uh, it then um, slows the wind down. So um, paper doesn't get off blown off decks. Um, it attenuates it um, and it filters it so that then uh, all the particulates are taken um, out of the air. Um, and there's also a lot of noise baffles in there too. So street noise from outside um, is, is rapidly damped down when you're in the building. So in a sense that gets the air into the office space, which is great. Um, but then where does it go? Uh, so these floor plates were incredibly wide um, and therefore then the challenge for us was how can you then begin to naturally ventilate an incredibly wide, almost city block size piece of architecture in, in the city of London. Um, and the answer then came again from sort of old um, studying how uh, in, in, in previous generations before we invented air conditioning, how we might have ventilated spaces there. And, uh, quite simply, going from residential architecture through to bigger architecture, um, chimneys are a way, obviously, of sort of naturally ventilating the building. So mm -hmm. in the centre of the building, we then created this multi-storey um, atrium space, which became a big circulation space too, but it's one of its primary functions is to create this sort of chimney uh, effect that goes throughout the whole building. So as air comes in on the outside edges of this section, um, it then comes into the building. As it comes into the building, it's warmed by computers, it's warmed by people, it's warmed by activity within, within the project. 
And then when it arrives then on the inside of the edge of the atrium, as it's warmer air, it then rises through the atrium and is exhausted out through the roof. And that, of course, then means that more air is brought in at the perimeter to replace the air which is being exhausted out of the roof. So you get this natural ventilation chimney stack effect system that occurs uh, through the whole building. Again, this is a totally passive system um, that actually we tried to develop uh, that works incredibly well. We ran a whole series of computer simulations um, with it. We also got, uh, we ran with some fluid dynamics people internally. And we also worked with Cambridge University on some super clever uh, predictive um, fluid dynamics to sort of ensure uh, that this would, would work. We wanted to make sure it worked before we built it uh, to make sure that it would actually work as effectively as, as we thought it would. Um, and it was an incredibly interesting process trying to optimize um, the, the um, amount of baffles on any given facade uh, for the amount of wind that would hit on that facade. Um, so that again, it became optimized for uh, natural ventilation penetration, but also minimized for disruption due to um, noise and, and, um, and, uh, and the other things that people don't want to interfere with. So it became a really interesting series of studies about how we can optimize uh, for ultimate performance, but keep out the things that we didn't want to have. So at the bottom, of, so that the facade on the outside of the building, I showed you a couple of slides ago, and then this is essentially the chimney. Uh, this is essentially then um, the circulation space in the middle of the of the project, and these are the and sort of the natural ventilation raised uh, roof baffles uh, on the skylights that you see at the top of the of this slide. Um, the the centerpiece of the project then became the centerpiece of the project in sort of environmental terms, but it also then took on a life of its own in terms of being the centerpiece uh, of the project in terms of the, the life of the building uh, for the users uh, as well and the visitors. So and we wanted this building to sort of have a kind of a, a sustainable life over and above what you might want from a normal commercial building. And, and, and centered to that, we thought was actually that business and offices and, and life in, in sort of buildings is about communication. Business is about, communi is about communication. Therefore, um, talking this through with the Bloomberg team, we kind of uh, came up with this idea that the more we can increase communication, um, the better their business would be and the more we could offer the chance to be able to see each other there, the more chances for informal interactions, casual interactions, ad hoc interactions, accidental interactions. And then the more chances there are for cross pollination between ideas, between people, between ideas, between communication, and therefore then their business would grow and be better, would be better for that. And therefore then this atrium space became this um, spiral, this staircase, this viewing gallery, this bump into each other space, this talking space, this ad hoc meeting space, the spirals up through the building and becomes this and became this sort of oversized slow staircase. It was deliberately larger, deliberately bigger, deliberately informal, deliberately overviewing every single thing to enhance the chances for people to have ad hoc meetings, interactions, exchanges, to see people, to talk to people, to call across to people, and to have the chance if you see people on the stair to simply step aside and other people will walk back past you. Uh, and therefore then in some ways the oversized steps were also an opportunity for people to stand and have a conversation for two minutes, three minutes, five minutes, and then move on and not feel as though they were standing on the staircase. So it became this really kind of key uh, point within the building and the kind of the social heart of the building, the beating heart of the building is this staircase. It links from the social interaction areas through to the work areas as you, as you saw here earlier and has become this kind of key, uh, key motif for the whole project. Um, central to the other part of the building where then was the ceiling system. You can see here um, in this slide, uh, there's a series, a huge number of series of uh, petals as we, they became known uh, in the ceiling. There are two and a half million of these across the whole project. And each of them is a, a unique, almost little tiny radiator. So the whole ceiling is uh, not done through an active air system. It's done through a passive uh, cooling system. And each of these little packed petals is a little radiator. Each radiator has a little LED in the middle of it. So the lighting, the cooling, uh, all comes uh, from the seeding system and sort of a very sort of very simple passive uh, passive system and which again helps to sort of create a, a super sustainable um, low air velocity um, uh, 
approach uh, for, for the whole project. Um, so uh, when it was finished, um, the BRIAC team from the UK came in and assessed it. They assessed it as the most uh, sustainable building that they'd assessed from a commercial perspective that they'd assessed anywhere in the world. Um, and we were, which was kind of for us, um, a kind of um, um, something that we're super proud of, I guess. I mean, we've been talking uh, a lot in this in this brief talk to you about how we've been trying to constantly, I suppose, explore and understand uh, how we can begin to work in, in different environments. Um, and therefore to try and work in some ways in this environment, which is quite a challenging environment, and from an urban sense um, in the centre of the city of London, um, we were it was it was it was um, it was something that we were yeah to say we were we were proud of that we managed to create something that created so um, that achieved so well in terms of its uh, sustainability characteristics and across across all number of uh, assessment criteria. Okay, I think one last one to go also in a um, a very beautiful climate in California, which is our Apple Park uh, campus in Cupertino in California, which. Can tell you about. Oh, as exciting as Bloomberg, uh, we have another workplace that we work on and it's Apple Park in Silicon Valley. And the campus is very Californian in spirit and it's very open and it's very connected to nature. And there's an interesting story behind Apple Park. So one of the early meetings between Norman Foster and Steve Jobs formed the building as it is today. And when they were walking on the site, Steve Jobs recalled his youth days and described the site as a football of America. And because also on the site, there were a lot of apricot trees. And we wanted to translate this, uh, this uh, football of America idea uh, as a project. And the image on the left, as you can see, is the, is the existing site. And the statistics tell us that the half of the site is covered in asphalt. And there's uh, 24 buildings that they were mainly car park and there's just a little bit of landscaping. And on its final transformation, there's almost no tarmac and everything is about landscape. Also, another interesting statistic is there's 30% of more people on the site, but the number of buildings downsize into two. I mean, you might think like, yes, this is an enormous building, but you don't actually get the scale from this view. So when you're in the heart of the circle, um, the building become kind of horizon to you and you see the creation, recreation of Californian landscape. And when you go out of the other part of the ring, the buildings start to dissolve in the landscape and it starts to become seamless. Getting closer to the facade, uh, there is this linear design feature that provides shading but also bouncing the light deep in the heart of the building. And you see on the side of this overhang, it's reflective and that helps to bring the landscape around the building very inside. And you can see where the curved sheet of glass and overhang connects, there's a junction detail. And this detail helps to move and control the airflow, but also filter the insects and dust. I mean, although the California have an amazing climate, so to take an advantage of this amazing weather, we with the help with the help of a lot of uh, like with the help of these details and the air flow inside of the building and leaves the building from its center. So all the workplace has constant fresh air and also like the smell of the apricot trees. So the interior is also having uh, this expansive views of the landscape. It feels like you're working, collaborating, and meeting in the nature. And the floor structure uh, spans up to like 15 meter, and it's known as the void slab. And that also incorporates radiant heating and cooling, and it helps with the air return. So everywhere around the floor plate, your connection to the green is interrupted. So being this close to the nature, actually being inside of the nature creates like an ideal, healthy, and comfortable workplace for continued cre creativity and innovation. Great. Um, I think that's it. I think we probably, I don't know, maybe slightly overrun. We said 45 minutes, I think we've taken up an hour, so we took slightly longer than we were intended, so apologies uh, for that. Um, I guess we just got, this is our last slide, and we just wanted to say that I guess um, 
Uh, for us, the idea of trying to um, work, uh, create a building that is in harmony with nature kind of goes back to the very early days of when Norman founded the practice. The sort of sketch on the top left of this slide here um, is one of his very early studies back in the 1970s when he first founded the office. And it was a, a project that he was thinking about in Africa at the time, which was actually about how you might create a residential um, environment, which was um harvesting the wind you can see the, the windmills and uh, harvesting the sun um, through solar panels and also composting uh, bathrooms and composting toilets and now then you might be able to sort of live in a much more harmonious way in an environment in africa uh, where the services uh, were hardly going to be available and therefore then how would you begin to work in a way that you could live in that environment in a way in harmony with with the environment and i think in some ways um what we've tried to do from then to now is, is do that through all the buildings that, that we've done um, and, and i think it's it's something that we still strive to do and we're still striving to do better with each of the buildings um, that we do um, and I think it's something that we think is obviously super important given the climate crisis that we're all facing as humans on, on the planet at the moment um, we would love to talk about anything that we've that we've done um, I would open to any sort of questions uh, that we might have and, uh, and so thank you thank you so much for listening um, we hope, uh, hope, hope you enjoyed it Well, I just want to thank you, in fact, for the efforts which you were doing up to now and for the health and safety of the world. So, thanks a lot. Um, it was the inspiration we got from the uh, presentation. I uh, can't really tell what we feel from here. So we are, we are proud with you, especially with the women who is more than and girls and women who are working for all the issues. So thank you very much. Uh, and from, from the uh, presentation, we realized that uh, nowadays fluid dynamics is a part of design <laughs> because of this. Uh, climatic problems which we are facing, uh, and also you showed very smart ideas uh, for the solutions of sustainability, uh, and it was the 
medical part of your basic um, architecture, I guess. So this is why you're that famous. Um, for example, that uh, Apple Park. Oh, yeah, perfect. <laughs> Thank you very much for all these efforts. Uh, and I have the first question, and then uh, probably uh, people here will have different questions. Uh, now, during all these, of course, the client is the most important character, which is just showing the way to where uh, to go. So uh, I want to listen. Uh, how you proceed with the clients at the first meeting, uh, if you can tell something about that, I'd be really happy. First client meeting, but yeah, that's also okay. No, no, we can definitely, I that's okay. We can definitely talk about that, I think. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so I try to talk about that. Now? Sure. Okay, I, it, I think it's um, it's actually it's a it's a it's a really good question um, um, about uh, talking. How do you talk to clients about these issues? Um, and there are there are a couple of um, stories that that we um, that, that we tell to clients when we, when we talk about this. Um, in some ways, the most obvious story and the most obvious. Uh, way to talk about this is obviously to say we should simply be building sustainably the, the world that needs this and, and therefore you know surely we all agree with this but but we understand that sometimes the the kind of the the heartfelt imperative to do it maybe sometimes is not enough and clients still say but it will cost me more money i can't afford to do it and therefore therefore what do i do so uh, we then um, uh, talk to them then about where the world is going. And, and I think um, increasingly, I think um, uh, people understand that um, everyone in the world who will be renting a, a, a piece of their office space or will be buying one of their apartments, um, these people all have their own consciences and they all have... Uh, their own children and they all have their own children's children and I think they look at these the future and they realize that then they have to do something for this and if they don't do something then maybe then if they build an office building and the building is not at the cutting edge of sustainability um, then actually then other people will be building buildings that are at the cutting edge of sustainability and therefore, then when people look at two buildings side by side and they go, well, I could be in this building or I can be in this building, but this one is very, very sustainable. And that makes me feel good. I can look my kids in the eye and I can look my parents in the eye and I can feel OK about telling them what I've done. Then I think I will go for this one. And I think um, we are we are we are confident actually that, that that human nature will help us here. Actually, I think we all um, I think at heart we are all good people, and I think uh, I think we all want to do the right thing. And I think even if there's no um, emotional reason for someone to do this, I think the commercial reason where we say to people. But if you don't do this, people will simply not choose your building. They will simply choose the building that is more sustainable. And therefore, from, the, from, from, from our commercial perspective, we think you would be advised to do this because if you don't, you will be left behind. Mm -hmm. and, and we think that applies to commercial architecture almost, almost uh, incredibly uh, strongly. But we also feel the same about, about residential architecture and, and other architecture too, that the buildings that are designed and projects that are designed and things that are designed that are not, um, that are not in harmony or trying to be in harmony now, I think we say to people that, you know, with the, with the greatest respect, you will be left behind. This is happening very, very quickly and it's changing very, very quickly. And the generation coming through behind us, the Beatles generation, not my generation, the generation coming behind us, they feel this even more than we do. They really, really feel this. And they will, they will go out of their way to, um, to be in buildings that are sustainable, to buy sustainable clothing, to travel sustainably, to work with sustainable people. Uh, people that are not damaging the world are the people that they will migrate to. 
And therefore, you kind of turn your back on this at your peril, we think. Um, and, and we think that's a good thing. Um, and we think that actually that, that, is, um, that, that, that is the future. So I think um, we try to talk to clients and say that, you know, obviously it's your building and, and obviously it's your money. And we, we totally respect that. But we, we cannot emphasize to you enough how, in our opinion, in our global experience, that if you are not doing this, you are already way behind the curve and, and you will be left further behind very rapidly. Um, and, and, the, um, and your competitors are not, are not taking the same decisions as you. They are taking what we believe is more informed and more appropriate decisions. And therefore, you know, we would advise you to, to sort of to follow suit. So I think, I don't know if that answers your question and how we try to approach it, but we, um, obviously no one can be forced to do this, but we think the, um, the emotional uh, reasons for doing it are obvious, but we think there are also completely compelling commercial reasons to do this um, as, as well. And yeah, I mean, since the beginning of the first also client meeting, it's like, the, the sustainability is very integrated on the design concept since the beginning. So it's not like we are setting up a design and we come up with a design concept, then we adopt the sustainability at the end. And so because the design evolves with like since the beginning with the sustainable principle. So it's deep into the like, it's something that we cannot take out. So it's not actually something coming loss on the first client meeting, but coming with the whatever project that we work because those are the principles and we learn them from the history and background and concept. So it is evolving with the design. So yes, we talk about uh, how we can do an energy efficient building, but we just actually in Foster don't talk about just to make it energy efficient. It's very integrated on the process different than I think that is that that is makes I think also foster very special so it's not an additional thing that we talk about it's like very core on everything so also your presentation the traditional houses and now I have the answer to how to start with the client who started from the grandchildren uh, of them the solution if, if I understand right thank you for the answer uh, and uh, I don't know if we have time for the questions other questions or do you want us to cut here do you have time for five ten minutes we do yes no problem no problem whatsoever happy to answer questions mm -hmm. Question <gülüyor> Bir öneri şeklinde bir e, söylem belki. Doğa kanunlarıyla uyumlu binalar yapmak için doğa kanunlarından da yararlanmayı, doğa kanunlarının kendisini kullanmayı hatta deneyim bence. Örnek olarak hangi doğa kanunu derseniz, mesela Anadolu Tüskülüsü müthiş bir doğa kanunu. Doğa kanunlarının en kırklı olanı gelmiş geçmiş bir olanlarından bir tanesi. Dolayısıyla kadın anneleri daha doğrusu e, bu konuda belli hani müşteri diyorsunuz ya müşteri demeyeyim bence her zaman. Müşteri çünkü kendisinden e, bir kar elde edilecek birisi gibi müşteri kelime anlamı olarak dediğinizde ikinci olarak işinizi zorlaştırıyorsunuz. Yapı sahibinizde onları da etmiş oluyorsunuz. Anneleri içgüdüsel olarak e, bu içgüdülerini kullanıp çocuklarını korumak e, için var bu içgüdü. Dolayısıyla çevre planını, vaziyet planını oluştururken bu içgüdü kullanırsanız işiniz çok kolaylaşır. Birçok şey kendiliğinden görür. Çok teşekkürler. Evet. Son söylediğinizi bir daha tekrarlayabilir misiniz son cümleyi acaba? Son cümleyi acaba? Nereye anlamadınız? 
Ee, son, so, son sorunuzu bir daha tekrarlayabilir misiniz? Soru değil aslında, Ömer'in tavsiye aslında. Yani annelik içgüdüsü en önemli doğa kanunlarından bir tanesi. Yani siz de hep doğayla uyum diyorsunuz ya, doğa kanunlarını kullanıp doğayla uyum sağlamak daha kolay. Dolayısıyla annelik içgüdüsü, mesela bir vaziyet planı, bir, e, bir kent parçası oluştururken, e, öyle konutlar ve öyle bir cadde düzenlemesi yaparsınız ki çocuk işine, yani okuluna, Alışverişe, sokaktaki oyununu kendisi taşı sırasında karşılaşmadan halledebilir. Dolayısıyla anne der böylece birçok şey çocuk sokakta büyüyebilir. Sokakta büyüdüğü için hayata çok erken atılır. Dolayısıyla mimarlık aracılığıyla e, toplumu hayata daha erken hazırlarsınız. Bu müthiş bir doğayla uyum konusudur. <gülüyor> Um, he is actually talking about like how we how he uh, how he approach to sustainability, but also how you also talk about the emotional way of uh, like we actually think you, you actually think about the, how a kid um, will grow up. That's the responsibility, and how an old person will use the building. But he also want to he also agree that is like if you want to design a master plan, uh, it's like if you put a uh, by nature if you put the kid there mm. and then if you actually create like a crossing and then from that crossing is like uh, if you don't put a crossing the kid will pass but if you if you have a crossing the kid won't pass so it's like it's actually like he's speaking back to the natural uh, the emotional way of like uh, how we actually created the building mm. um yeah and then they were on this one there was no question mm. question that yeah. he was just like yeah. wanted to add it up no it's good i agree yeah, yeah no i know that's that's good i i am um, and i think you know I mean, I, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, we, I, I, I'm, I was very aware in the talk that when we were, then we were talking about it a little bit beforehand, that there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of science somehow in it. There's a lot of research in it, and we are, we are huge believers in, in the science. And we're huge believers in the research um, because you can't deny facts, you can't deny figures. Um, but ultimately, um, although we're huge believers in, in research to create a timeless architecture that's kind of based on something that is immutable, um, but ultimately, though, architecture is about, um, it's about humans and we're all, we are, we're all emotional people, you know, we all have emotional needs and, um, and so therefore we're always very aware that although we need to try to create something which is scientifically um, strong and, and based on fantastic sort of principles and ideas that that are that are that are um, that can never be challenged uh, but there's also this desire to create something which is which is which is intangible something which is beautiful for people um, and that responds to people's emotions so when people walk into the building they have an emotional reaction to it so this this kind of um, uh, for us the I guess the the challenge and the and the the um, the aim and the, the desire is always to create something which is at once timeless and scientific, um, but is also beautiful and makes people um, stop and admire and, and hopefully love and and sort of have a, a, a feeling where the building is enhancing the that moment for them, that day for them, that that visit for them, that coffee for them, whatever. But it's a, it adds to their day and makes the that moment for them or whatever it might be a better a better moment, a better day, a better experience for them, a better meeting, a better encounter, a better street uh, or whatever that might be. Um, and to try and create that is obviously is a, is um, is something which is. Um, it's very human, um, and so therefore the 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 challenge and the the um, the, the desire is always to create something which is a uh, one at once kind of scientific and rigorous, um, but is also human and beautiful. I and mean, so bringing those together is the is uh, yeah, it's always the aim. <laughs> I mean, that's that's the that's the that's the challenge. Well, yes. Any more 
members wish. Uh, thanks for your inspiring uh, presentation. Yes, uh, climate change uh, and global warming and reaching energy is getting difficult every day. It's getting more fast, right? Uh, first and partners are very unique. Uh, one of the best uh, design companies in the world. And the projects in Shomas are very unique projects. But there are hundreds of thousands of millions of uh, size, small size architectural offices. And uh, Mr. Inka told the truth that the architects are sharing the guilt by not doing the sustainable buildings, right? So, uh, what is your opinion to make size and small size architectural offices all around the world? Make the proper uh, simulations and uh, analysis on sustainability and uh, how governments force architectural offices and the contractors to build sustainable buildings to reach a better world. Thank you very much. Besides of architectural offices, is that what it was? Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, maybe it's, uh, what I understand is like yeah. we are like contributing to the world and, and then it's the... Trying to give us a message too. Yeah, I think, I, I think what we... I, what I, the sustainable analysis, how we are maybe doing the analysis at all. Okay, I, I I think I it wasn't super clear on the and from the from our from the microphone here. So forgive me if we if we don't answer it correctly. Um, I think what you were asking was um, uh, I thought it was about size of offices. You were saying big and small offices, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and how then? And I were you saying were you saying how then? Um, how do we work? Um, how do how do you think it's possible? Was it how it possible to work if it's a small office in a big office? Mm -hmm. How can they undertake, undertake the same analysis? Is that what the question? Yes, like how maybe is like how is for example maybe is the quality of analysis is somehow different, or yeah. how we maybe how we are using the products to get like programs to get those sustainable results? Mm -hmm. or what are we using? Oh yeah, okay. Um, so we, you, then, um, uh, yeah, you're you're right. We're lucky, I guess, in that we have a relatively big um, research team, which I think comes from the benefits of having a, a big office. And, I, and, and, and you're right. Um, we're sort of we're very lucky. We have a lot of very um, smart guys in London that we were telling you about at the beginning. You're sort of smarter than smarter than architects, maybe. Um, and um, so they 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 do write some um, bespoke. Um, uh, analysis tools for us that we use on, on projects um, and uh, they help inform a lot of the things that we do, a lot of the decisions that we make um, and then we often, often write and bespoke um, scripts and bespoke analysis for individual projects um, that are completely just related to that, to that project and the climate and the parameters of the site and the, and the requirements of the client that are sort of based into that, to, to that project. Um, and, and yeah, we're super certainly very lucky uh, to have that. Um, I think um, I, I think if you were asking how would a smaller office approach this, um, I think I think it's a really really good question. And and I, I guess what we do though believe in is that actually that um, uh, we always work with some the best engineers that that we possibly can too. And although we run a huge amount of analysis ourselves, we always want to work. Um, hand in hand with um, with the engineers on on the team as well, and we absolutely believe that the best buildings that we have ever created as a as a studio are the buildings where we are um, hand in hand with the engineers, and the, in some ways the the moment where architecture gives way to engineering and where engineering gives way to architecture is almost imperceptible you can really not see the join where these two things uh, come together that structure that's MEP that's all the different systems if they are integrated and coordinated as one unique design piece of design that is that's where we think that the beauty lies in in, in road architecture um, and and some of those architect the, those engineering firms that we use are are small little firms they are the boutique firms that do really very clever 
things are very smart people with very clever brains who do really really lovely work we think um we've grown to be quite big but we like to think that we operate very small um the teams we put on projects are um are invariably not big and um, so uh, the murray building that i was lucky enough to work on here in hong kong was a team of um uh, seven people ten people at, at its peak average of seven people and when we were running it on site there were four of us uh, here in hong kong that were running it on site um so unless they are very 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 big projects which obviously need bigger teams but the the average project size that we try to run within the office we try to keep as not big we try to keep them again very human um, and we try to keep the relationships very human um, so that you can have a great team relationship and that relationship they can have a great relationship with the clients and they can also have great relationships with the engineers um, and we think that continuity of relationship in a smallish team uh, running from beginning to end so those people those people know where the project came from and they know the original sketches and then they know why those sketches developed into the details. So the details can be informed by those original sketches. So the, the cladding interfaces and the services interfaces are much informed by the original concepts um, as, as, as what you come into the detail design phase. And then we run those people through all the way through when the building is being built again. So they know because they know they know the guiding principles of the project from the very early days. So we believe you can make the best decisions on the site if you're informed by the very early thinking. So we try to keep these small teams and mm -hmm. core teams that run all the way through the project. And hopefully that gives the project um, a kind of a continuity of um, concepts and a continuity of thinking and a continuity of kind of um, aspiration, maybe that it means that at the end it's still it's still valid in terms of what you try to achieve at, at the beginning. So although we are a big collective of people, the teams we run, we try to keep quite intimate um, and quite small. So they have a very intimate relationship with the project and um, is how we try to uh, run it, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And on those small teams, like every project, actually the benefit of having with a smaller team is, for example, if on as the Colin said earlier, like on the first slide, for sustainability, we have specialists for that. We have in-house structure engineer, we have interior designer, on, but her, but his approach is actually included since the beginning. And they, same people always continue almost like towards the end of the project. So everyone knows the project since the first sketch, even it's a, in, even someone specialized on interior design. They're included since the first concept sketch, if, even if it's an architecture project. Or same thing for sustainability. It's like we always have feedbacks, like since the beginning, there are people like who specialize only materials or even like some people only tell us is like, uh, so there are like different departments, the, generally like the architecture teams, they're like we have certain amount of people and we keep it small, but there's always like feedback coming from different specialties. So that's what make our projects very, um, so let's say it's like very like three dimensional way of thinking of how we approach to the design. So there's a lot of input on different kinds of backgrounds. So that's why I think we always have very interesting results and we can speak a lot about even on one project because when we tell them when 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 we are doing the narration we always think it's like oh there's also this and also that and that's mainly because on the background of a project there's a huge way of thinking that is getting actually feed I get, get the, actually there's a lot of like brain thinking of it, but there is a core small team, but then the whole idea of that small team is open to all the other like smaller, let's say sustainability structure or interior, but whoever is like feeding the, that team. Merhaba. Ee, benim sorum e, 
şeyle ilgili olacak, yapay zeka ile ilgili olacak. E, yapay zeka bugün e, tasarım yapabiliyor. Acaba e, ileriki zamanlarda mimarların yerini alabilir mi? Bu teknoloji buraya gelebilir mi? Gelirse ne zaman gelir? Teşekkürler. So he's asking about artificial intelligence and he's thinking in the future are there going to be like robots or like uh, is some people or something going to replace architects? And yeah. if that was going to happen, when it was going to happen? <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I, uh, I, I, um, yeah, my, my, um, my head tells me that architects will ultimately be replaced. Um, I, but maybe not for every building, but I, I can imagine certainly for a very, very large percentage of buildings. I mean, maybe, maybe the, the new National Gallery in, in Istanbul will be always be designed by, a, by an architect, possibly. But, but I can imagine all housing in the future will just be AI. I, I agree. I think it's very, very likely. I think, you know, translations, AI, um, why, why wouldn't they be? You know, I think it's a, I think it must be kind of, um, I'm sure there's a lot of parameters that can be fed into, a, into an AI and they will come up with a, a countless varieties of versions uh, of, 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 of a design. Um, I, 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 so I, I think, yeah, my head tells me that, that you're right, that I think in the future, the majority of buildings will be AI designed. Um, I, my heart tells me that uh, that that I that the that, that the 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 buildings that are though maybe the most human, um, maybe all cultural buildings, maybe you know galleries, uh, theaters, um, performance spaces, maybe parliament buildings, um, uh, maybe these buildings, which I think maybe goes to the core. Of, um, of our kind of dreams and uh, the core of what we want as a species and as a, as a people. Um, my heart tells me that I kind of hope that they will always be designed by humans. I think they should be designed by humans. I, um, I, I would like to think that, that we, we uh, intuitively will be able to design um, somehow more buildings which resonate more with us as a species Uh, it's certainly our most important building. So our uh, democ democratic flagship building is our, our, our most poignant cultural buildings. I would love to think humans will always be better at designing those. Mm -hmm. um, I, um, but maybe not. But maybe not. I mean, I, I think when you see the, you know, when we, when you see the progress that's made so rapidly um, in so many things i i can i know I, i i can imagine a time when yeah when architecture is ai driven you know i am um i i i hope not um but i but i think i can imagine that quite quickly um uh the the vast majority of of, of building if not architecture will, will could be quite easily done by by ai yeah i mean Yeah, yeah, rapid housing um, uh, for sure, uh, for sure could be done. I, I, I think could be done, and, and you know, and and I would, I will always argue that will it be as poetic? Will it be as profound? Um, maybe not, but 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 will it be? Will it be okay? Probably, and probably it will be okay. I, I agree that the special buildings should uh, probably not gonna be replaced with AI design, but like as you said, like public building, parliament building, museum, because those spaces are actually like spaces to narrate emotion. Mm -hmm. But then now looking at the, for example, when we sometimes work with a, a like residential developer, um, like their typical ones, they already have their design guidelines that they give you what what can be the dimension between your wardrobe and bed and because not because they want to like harm your design, but they want the maximum efficiency because they, they want to maximize their efficiency. So kind of like uh, those kind of guidelines put you in a put you in a like certain parameter and put your design on a certain parameter. And I think at the end of the day, that kind of like 
also like some people write like scripts on Grasshopper about, oh, this is your one bedroom, most optimum floor plate. And this is what happens when you add one more bedroom next to it. So then it starts to shape kind of like the floor plan itself by just writing a parameter and then coding it on Grasshopper. But looking at the end of the day, none of those space will be designed by emotion. None of those space, even I think it's computer generalized uh, or artificial with artificial intelligence. They won't have any emotion or any sense. It will be out of computer and it will be probably can get like 3D printed and can be just machine made buildings. And at the end of the day, whoever are going to use those buildings are humans. So, and we are not robots. So if we would be robots as well, okay, maybe that would sense, but we are always looking for a connection with the space when we are going around. So I'm thinking in the future, yes, every, uh, maybe AI can replace an architect, but can it be better? Probably not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a really good question. And I, I was just thinking to us that it was talking. I, I read a recent piece which I thought was quite funny. There was a um, it was a it was a uh, chess grandmaster was playing a new computer program. And um, and uh, the first two, it was a game best of it was five games. And the first two games, the, the computer program totally blitzed the grandmaster, it wasn't even close. But then in the third game, the grandmaster actually made a mistake. And he admitted afterwards he made a mistake. And the, the interesting thing was the computer lost that game because the computer didn't understand that it was a mistake. The computer thought if the grandmaster was trying to do something very clever and actually then tried to play the game to thinking the grandmaster was doing something, a move that he didn't, that he hadn't quite understood. And so the computer lost that game. Of course, in the, in the next two games, the grandmaster didn't make any mistakes, and he totally blitzed by the computer. But I thought it was, I thought it was interesting that actually, that in some ways, um, when we fail, we win as humans, or when we when we slip, we make choices which could maybe be better for us. So I think this idea that in actual fact, through through error, we we gain because. I think through error we sometimes learn, and I think, uh, and I think that is kind of quite. I think that's quite human, and I think it's quite architectural. I think um, sometimes things happen which are maybe not what you would expect, but actually great things come from that. So I, I kind of hope um, that uh, that uh, that the creative community, architects, dancers, um, artists, sculptors, choreographers. I think that the, all the creative community, um, I hope that we all, none of us, I hope that we don't all get replaced. <laughs> um, but I, because I think that kind of sometimes the, the unexpected and the maybe the error or maybe the, the, the opposite, which I think is what as creative people, we're, we're all together here. I think it's maybe it's that that we provide, which is sometimes the, the moment of light in someone's life or it's the moment of light in a, in a piece of architecture or it's the moment of light in a performance or a piece of art and i and i think it's that it's that it's that it's that difference it's suddenly that thing which is which is um maybe wrong maybe it's an error but when you but through the error you see something and you realize something or you understand something and that's it's it's a human thing to make an error, and 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 then I think we learn from those errors. So, so I I, I kind of um, I think it's a great question. 